Good afternoon. Again, my name is Jake Sloan. I'm the uh, author of the book, Standing Tall, Willie Long, and the original 21ers. This is the story of 25 courageous men who stood up, stood tall, in fact, against discrimination in hiring, training, promotions, and equal pay at Mare Island Naval Shipyard, which is just a few miles northeast of here. I was one of those 25 men. This is a story that includes both heroism and tragedy. The major event started in 1961 and extended to the time that the shipyard closed in 1996. What I'd like to do today is give you the broad view of what happened, kind of the overview, and a little bit about how the book was developed. Also, of course, I want to talk about um, heroism, both in the general and the particular sense. When I was first contacted about participating in the round table, I was more than a little bit surprised because I never thought of myself as a hero, especially in connection with those events that took place so long ago. So I did, after some thinking, I did what I should have done at the outset. I looked up the meaning of the word hero. <laughs> From that, I got that uh, for me, a hero is a courageous person who encourages other people to also be courageous. And so I'm going to talk in the context of the uh, leader of the group, the group, and, and then just a little bit about what would be my particular kind of heroism if there is such a thing. I think it's important to talk about heroism at this time in our history, especially at this time, because it's important for a societal change. In 1960, there were more than 1,000 African Americans working at Mare Island Naval Shipyard. The great majority of them were men. For decades, they had worked under conditions of extreme discrimination, some systematic, some organized, and some unintended. This discrimination was in the areas, again, of um, hiring, training, promotions, and equal pay. Now, it should be noted that um, although there was discrimination on the shops on the shipyard, conditions were better than they were for people working in the trades in the private sector on the outside, especially in the building trades. That notwithstanding, over the three decades leading up to 1960, there had been increasing dissatisfaction with the status quo. And so in 1961, inspired by John Edmondson and led by Willie Long, a group of men decided that they would organize to file a complaint with the federal government. Notwithstanding foot dragging at the part of, on the part of the federal government and on the part of the leadership at Mir Island, that action brought about significant change. Slow, but rather dramatic change over time, both at Maryland and at other installations around the country. Now, it wasn't easy to organize on the island. In fact, it was very difficult. It took tenacity and courage to organize on that shipyard. What we were up against was entrenched thinking about the role and responsibilities of African Americans in the workforce. That entrenched thinking was held by not only whites, but by many, many African Americans, because many of the people who worked in the shipyard, both white and black, had origins in the South, where such discriminatory practices were the order of the day. They were accepted and expected. In fact, we often had more of a difficult time with resistance from African Americans than we did from the whites. The organizing was hard, and it was dangerous, because if the leadership at Mare Island had discovered that we were organizing, we would have been fired summarily, uh, no doubt. We didn't think that, we knew it. The struggle was long, although this had been building for a number of years, even after the organizing started, it took Willie Long and the leaders many months to pull that effort together, many months. We talked when we could, we talked in the shops, we talked on the ships, wherever we could, always in secrecy. 
Some of us carpooled together from the nearby cities of Richmond, Berkeley, and Oakland, and we talked as we rode along. Some of us patronized the same barber shops, and we talked there. We talked always in secrecy, sometimes even in coded words. In some ways, it all started in Shop 56, the pipefitter's shop, where John Edmondson started working as an apprentice in 1930. Willie Long started working there in 1946. Jim Jefferson, who is one of the four surviving 21ers now, started working there in 1952, and I started working there in 1960. The hero of this story, the real hero in my mind, was Willie Long, who was without doubt the leader in the organizing and the implementation of our strategy. He was mentored by John Edmondson. Both of them were very inspirational for Jim Davis and I and others in our shops and other shops on the shipyard. They still inspire me. I often think about what they did for me and, and the others at the shipyard. Uh, even though they're long gone, they still inspire me. Both Willie and John were fearless men, prideful men, full of pride, and they believed in excellence and fair play. They were warriors. They were courageous. They were heroes. They have had some influence over everything that I've done in a positive manner and a courageous manner in social change and activism since that time. What started in Shop 56 spread to other areas of the shipyard. And it was all about the fight against discrimination. But it was more than that. It was about the courage to face difficult situations for ourselves and the greater good. We did not organize so that we could integrate and socialize with white people. We organized for fair play and equality. It was hard. It, was, it took courage. When the um, organizing first began, the leaders discouraged the younger members from signing the complaint for various reasons. But there were four of us who were adamant and would not be denied. Ironically, three of us became leaders in the group. One, Jim Davis, became the president after a number of years. I was not a leader. Being a leader was not my destiny. We talked a lot. Ultimately, we, would only, we could only get 25 African Americans to file a complaint. 25 out of more than 1,000 would file the complaint and stand up with us for fairness. Over the years after the filing of the complaint, there was a dramatic change made at the shipyard. But as you'll see if you read the book, even when the shipyard closed in 1996, there were still challenges. Many others joined us over the years, but few were active. Ironically, some of the best promotions went to the men who refused to join us in signing the complaint. Sadly, Willie Long, the leader, never got a promotion to supervisor, although he was a great worker and a leader. This, coupled with the fact that we had some internal strife, as all organizations do, caused him to retire and leave the shipyard early as a tra uh, tragic, bitter man. Now, the leaders in Washington, the investigators from Washington, and the leadership in Maryland never admitted to discrimination. They laid everything at the foot of misunderstandings. But for us, there was no misunderstanding when some of us were working for $2 an hour for what whites were paid $3 an hour to perform. For us, there was no misunderstanding when John Edmondson, who was considered the best pipe fitter on the yard and a natural leader, couldn't be promoted after 30 years. Even now, when I think of it, sometimes it brings tears to my eyes. When the shipyard closed in 1996, the story of the 21ers was largely forgotten, except by the organizers. It was never widely known. 
At some point, I decided that I would tell the story, that I would write a book on the story. Now, writing the book, for me, was in many ways harder than the organizing. Sure, it took a hell of a lot longer. (laughs) The main challenge that I faced in writing the book was that by the time I came to it, a lot of time had passed, more than 40 years. Most of the original 21ers were dead. Of the eight that remained, there was confusion about what activities took place, the dates of the activities. You should understand that when we first started, secrecy was paramount, not record keeping, secrecy. Secrecy was so important that many of our family members didn't know about it until many years later. We we didn't talk about it with anyone. And these were men who were intelligent, great workers, but they were not writers and they were not historians by any stretch of the imagination. Even if they kept records, they were long lost by the time I came to the task. The person who would have kept the best records was Willie Long, but he was long deceased and I haven't been able to find from his family that there are any records or, or documents left, not even a photo. If the work was easy for me in any way, it was because I had participated in the activities at least in the first years, although I quit working at the shipyard in 1964. So with all that in mind, my approach was fourfold. One, I interviewed the 21ers and their families and others who worked at the shipyard at the time. I read newspaper articles. I did research at uh, naval archives and libraries. I even went so far as to go to Ann Arbor, Michigan to do, to do some research. And I read history books about that era. I owe a great debt of uh, indebtedness, a, a great gratitude to uh, Matthias Gaffney, who at the time was writing for the uh, Vallejo Times Herald. So as I begin to close, I want to say this. The full story has not been written. Probably never will be because of the lack of documentation and the passage of time. Am I a hero? If I am, it's because I was willing to stand up for what was right and what was fair for myself, for others, and even those who wouldn't even sign a document. Again, they got some of the best promotions. One of the leaders at that time told me, Jake, if we don't stand up and do something about this, it's going to back up on our children. I proudly and courageously stood up to do something with my other brothers. It was not my destiny to be a leader in the 21ers. It was my destiny to write the story, which I've done to the best of my ability. For doing that, for the story is so long untold, I'm at least a hero to the brothers that I've fought with and their descendants. Ultimately, why the story? I'm told that according to an old African proverb, when an elder dies, a library is burned. When I would die, I want a part of my library to stand. I want the story of the 21ers to live and be told forever. It's uh, an important story, a heroic story. Thank you. The Hero Roundtables are the global events that ask the question, what is a hero? You've just seen one hero talk. To find more and join the conversation, visit our website or social media.